قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد Today we are going to be discussing a very sensitive topic a topic that is very 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 difficult to do justice with and whichever way one discusses it is open for criticism but it is a topic that is necessary to talk of especially in the current situation that the Muslim Ummah faces. The Muslim world is in a crisis never seen before. Disunity, chaos, war, killing, foreign policies against Muslim lands, lack of true Muslim leadership, dictatorial rulers within our lands, frustrations by the common Muslim, which resulted in the Arab Spring, Muslim leadership, both political leadership and scholars, were unable to fulfill the vacuum that this Arab Spring created. Situation becoming worst. And one primary reason is the separation of the mosque and politics, the fall of the Khilafah. And when reference is made to disunity, when reference is made to the disunity of Muslims, and especially in the current situation, one's mind immediately goes to Iraq, to Syria, and consequently to the ISIS. One's attention is immediately drawn to the Khilafah it has proclaimed in an area straddling across modern Syria and Iraq. And this is the topic that I wish to talk today and that is the situation in Iraq, the situation in Syria, and the whole discussion around this movement that has come up, ISIS. But before going on to that, let's talk a little bit on the importance of the Islamic Khilafah. In the early 1920s, in the words of Lord Curzon, the British Foreign Minister at the time, appears to have captured the Khilafah's significance, the Khilafah's significance, Khilafah meaning the Islamic Khilafah, the governance of Islam and the Islamic republics. So the words of the British MP, Foreign Minister Lord Curzon, actually appears to have captured the Khilafat's significance when he announced to the House of Commons, we need to put an end to anything which brings about any form of Islamic unity between the sons of the Muslims. As we have already succeeded in finishing off the Khilafah, referring to the Ottoman Khilafah, we must ensure that there will never arise again unity for the Muslims, whether it be intellectual, 
or cultural unity. Now, since the demise of the Khilafah, the question of Islam in politics and the question of a Sharia-based government has confronted every Islamic movement in the Muslim world. Regardless of how they try to resolve or regardless of how they try to resolve the answer to this question of establishing a political Sharia-based Islamic government, whichever movement came up in the history of Islam since the collapse of the Khilafat Uthmaniyya, this was one major concern of most Muslim movements. Much has been said and thought regarding the proclamation of the Khilafa. When I'm talking about much has been said and much thoughts have been expressed regarding the proclamation of the Khilafa by the ISIS in Iraq or Syria. There are those who are nostalgic, having a feeling of good because of the good old days when we remember the good old days of the Khilafat Uthmaniyya. There are those who think that this was long overdue. There are those who are of the view that we wish to join the people who will emerge from Khurasan as has been predicted by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there are those who will support or who simply support the idea of ISIS or the idea of establishing an Islamic Khilafah primarily and most simply because it is against the West. However, on the other hand, there are those who are suspicious, citing a conspiracy. There are those that are suspicious, citing that this is backed by some Western powers. There are those who strongly oppose the tactics and the methodology employed. But rather, let me say, there are those who strongly oppose the alleged tactics and the methodology employed by this movement. Whatever the divergent views we have cited, I wish to share with you, during the course of this discourse, some thoughts on the matter. When we analyze the ahadith literature, and that also of a particular type, we can draw the conclusion that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam requested Allah three things. He prayed to Allah and asked Allah for three things. Two of his prayers were accepted. The third one was not accepted. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this ummah not be destroyed by a single natural catastrophe. He asked Allah that this ummah of his should not be entirely destroyed by a single natural catastrophe. This prayer of the Prophet ﷺ was granted. He asked Allah that the entire ummah will not be, or rather he asked Allah that external enemies should not completely annihilate the ummah. In other words, the entire ummah should not be annihilated by an external enemy. This prayer of the Prophet ﷺ was also granted. But he also asked that this ummah remain united. This prayer of the Prophet ﷺ was not granted by Allah. In fact, the unity will be destructive. It will lead to bloodshed. It will lead to mass killings. It will lead to death. 
And we see this, especially in the time that we are living, living in. This prayer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was not accepted by Allah, surfaced, the consequence of this prayer surfaced during the time of the Khilafah, or rather to the latter periods of the Khilafah. And in the long annals of history, it raised its head many times. However, in the current situation that we are living in, in the times that we are living in, in the era that we are living in, it has reached a very intensive state. The disunity that we see in the Ummah is actually frightening. And it is from among the signs of the last day. It can be gleaned from the ahadith that there will be disunity in the Ummah. It is a given. It has happened in the past. And it will be naive to think it is not happening presently. It is as clear as daylight. It will be foolish to imagine that it will not occur in the future. In fact, it will be worse in the future. Nonetheless, it does at all mean that we must become fatalist. That means, it does not mean that we must be fatalist and accept things and events as inevitable and just accept it and not try and not endeavor to establish unity because the quran kareem tells us wa'tasimu bihablillahi jami'a hold firm all of you onto the rope of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stay tuned inshallah when we return we will continue with this very important discussion about the condition of the ummah in the context of our era. <laughs> Before the break, we discussed a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherein he had made three requests to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had accepted two and did not accept one. The ones that he accepted that the entire ummah will not be destroyed by a natural catastrophe the second is the entire ummah will not be annihilated by an enemy. And the third, which Allah did not accept, is that the ummah must remain united. They must not be become disunited. This prayer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not accepted. Nonetheless, it does not mean that we must become fatalist and we must accept all things and events as inevitable and submit to fate. The doctrine that all events are subject to fate or inevitable, which is a predetermination and not be vigilant so that it does not occur. All wisdom, all efforts, all energies must be employed. All energies must be exhausted in order that we do not fall victim to divisive designs. We might be weak, but we will be much weaker if we allow others particularly our adversaries, to exploit our weakness. And therefore, there is a need for us to always work towards establishing the unity of this ummah. 
Having said what I have said as an introduction, or rather as a prelude, to the actual discussion that we are having, and that is, what is the situation today with regards to the claim of an establishment of a Khilafah in an area that spreads between Syria and Iraq? How do we as the common man look at the situation that is before us? At the onset, let me make it very, very clear that I am in no way and in no position to give a ruling or a judgment with regards to the sincerity or the insincerity, the truth or the falsehood of this organization that is the ISIS or any other such organization that has been established with the alleged sincere purpose of establishing a Khilafah. And I will come back to this aspect which I have just made mention of that I am in no position. But before going on to that, I would like to draw our attention to a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his guidance and in his concern and in his passionate concern for the welfare of his followers, that is you and I, the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find that Rasulullah in his advices, in his ahadith, has given us warnings. He has made reference to things that may come, especially closer to the end of times. He's given us warnings about this unity that the ummah will face. And he has also given us advice as to how to live our lives in those times. But for the purposes of our discussion, I would like to draw your attention to an amazing incident that took place during his time. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports that a person came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at Jarana on his way back from Hunayn. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was returning from the battle of Hunayn at a place called Jarana, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there and in the bag that was there with Bilal there was some silver or there was some spoils of war the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a handful out of that and bestowed it upon the people that were there. A person who had met the Prophet at Jarana, descriptions have been given to him who had a thick beard, broad-shouldered, shaven hair. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to him, Ya Muhammad, in an abusive tone. Firstly, addressing the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this tone. Ya Muhammad, a'dil, do justice. He said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Muhammad, do justice, meaning that you are not being just. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Waihak, wow be upon you. Who would do justice if I do not do justice? Who in the world will not be just if I am not going to be just? Who would do justice if I do not do justice? And you would be very unfortunate and a loser if I do not do justice. In another tradition, the Prophet wasallam said, that you accept me to be just and honest with the revelation of Allah, but you do not accept me to be just and honest with some material gains. And therefore he said, 
you would be very unfortunate and a loser if I do not do justice. Upon this, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Permit me to kill this hypocrite. Upon this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this is the beauty of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are great lessons in this incident. May there be protection of Allah. Meaning that may there be protection of Allah for this person. Oh Umar, if you kill him, people would say that I kill my companions. This man and his companions would recite the Quran. This is what the Prophet said. This man and his progeny would recite the Quran, but it would not go beyond their throat. And they would serve from his progeny. There will be people that the arrow will go through them like it goes through a prey. Meaning that Iman will exit them the way an arrow goes out of a prey. And from his progeny will be people with the mentality and people who, whose prayer would, when you see their prayer and when you observe their prayer, your prayer would seem inferior to theirs. When they stand up and they observe their fast, your fast would be seeming inferior to theirs. And when they recite the Quran, it will not even go below their throat. And there are many other ahadith about this type of group. Because the pioneer tried to be very smart, by advising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be fair, and they show themselves as good and pious people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they will appear when the Ummah will be disunited. Today, the Muslim Ummah is most disunited, most disunited than ever before. There is no tolerance left for other views. Instead of inviting Muslims to a common platform, there are scholars of different views who openly abuse others who have different views and claim that they are the only one on truth. That is the Jamaat of Muslims on the right path and to be entered into Jannah when the day of judgment come. From this incident, my beloved listeners, we need to draw a lesson. And in conclusion of our discussion today, and we will continue with this discussion, inshallah, as we go along. Firstly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that when the end of days will be near, this Ummah will be faced with much disunity. And during that time, there will be a group of people that will emerge whose outward appearance will be seeming to you very pious, but within themselves, they will be the people that will be causing much harm to this Ummah. Unfortunately, we do not have much time left, but I would like, I would like to continue with this discussion. Insha'Allah, in our next session, we will continue with the discussion from this hadith and come to some advice with regards to groups that are claiming to be on the right. And how do you and I, as ordinary Muslims, judge the situation that we are faced with. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Qur'ani nabdu hayati, Qur'ani tahradati, Qur'ani asmatu amri, 
قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري